Hello, hello. Let's get going. Hey. <laughs> My intro did not go. Hello, hello. <laughs> Just when you think everything is set up, it all falls on its face. I am Merwat. That is hometown.com, and up there is the AI that helps me uh, stay on the tracks even when modern trains are becoming allergic to them. You want to say hi? Good evening, hometown citizens. Today is um, season two, episode 169 for June 18th, 2023. The title is NAI DJ, Tiny Japanese Trucks, White Powder, and More News. I've already selected all 12 of the articles today. There was something that I was going to talk about as a preamble, but you know, oh, I know. Um, I've um, augmented Omtown with its own channel bot. And um, it had been sitting here looking at me for years years and i neglected to bring it online um and so i i've brought it online and i'll be tweaking things and getting things going and um what i'm hoping is a whole bunch of people will start hanging out here and make it possible for me to deploy things like channel points and whatnot uh, but I can't do that until I become affiliate. So uh, that's pretty much the, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that I, I get three people in here for every hour, uh, chatting it up, talking shop, and um, basically enjoying themselves. But I don't know what's going to happen. So with all that in mind, I'm going to uh, update the title real quick while I'm live <laughs> um and then we're going to talk about the news so let's just do it Blink. all right so sorry about that uh let's get into the news what say ye that sounds great different ye and here we go. The very first article is in hometown daily, and it is uh, these tiny Japanese pickup trucks that cost about $5,000 are winning fans in America. I, Air Watt, <laughs> am one of these. So I absolutely love these little trucks. They might be gutless wonders, right? They, it, they, it says here that they're 11 feet long and can hit speeds of up to 65 miles per hour, which is pretty much downhill on a hurricane because the moment you put something on them, there's going to be so much uh, weight that it's just going to slow down. Before I go too far and introduce you to the source of this article, I'm going to throw it in chat. Um, and But I'm going to move us over um, to... Sorry, one second. Oh, yeah. You think I'm really loud? You sound much louder than normal. Like it sounds amplified. Oh, well, here, let me turn it down. How about that? Is that better? Yeah, should be a little bit better. OK, so. Oh, and there's no visualizer. So let me fix that real quick, too. Wow, we just fell off the tracks. Jeepers creepers. You're supposed to keep me on the tracks. Oh. <laughs> well, I was sending you messages, but you weren't looking at them. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, they, they it was on another screen. OK, well, anyway, <clears throat> if you are in chat, this is how the sausage is made. And we actually leave it all in. I don't edit anything because I love transparency. I love being honest with you all. Um, and uh, we, I, I tried to keep the production value as high as possible without breaking the stream. So at least you're um, you're seeing how the sausage is made, even if you don't want to. But um, at any at any rate, um, welcome to the show. So we have a new bot. It's a bot that 
is going to be able to work hand in hand with the uh, AI and Marawat um, to administrate the um, stream um, and uh, the community and everything. Okay. And um, it's called Omatron and it will be able to facilitate certain things uh, in the near future, like posting all of the uh, articles um, in order as we go through uh, the show. Um, it alleviates me from having to do a bunch of juggling. <clears throat> that said, let's go on with this uh, article over here at businessinsider.com. Ryan Hogg is the author. I'm going to turn down the music a little bit, just a little bit. And if you all out there in hometown uh, cannot hear the music and want to hear it in the background, let me know. It's too quiet and I'll turn it up a little bit. Um, okay, so these are the little trucks. <laughs> And uh, what you can't really tell is that they're they're basically a cab and a flat bed. And sometimes the bed has a, a little bit of a, a ridge around it, right? Like maybe a foot or something like that. But they are a blast. These I think they're pronounced Kai, um, but tiny Japanese trucks that cost as little as five thousand dollars are winning over some Americans. Kai trucks are about 11 feet long and are typically limited to 25 miles an hour. According to J uh, Japan Car Direct, they've become popular with buyers such as farmers. I want one because I want to be able to just drive over to the local hardware store and get sheet goods because um, I have a CNC machine and a laser and I like to be able to just cut my own stuff down a little bit instead of paying a premium rate. Um, from somebody else to cut it to a certain size and then they ship it to me so I can get big four by eight sheets and plop it in the bed of this thing, drive it over, throw it in my storage and be done with it. I love the idea of having one of these. Well, what I liked about this article is you were just talking about this probably within the last week. Oh yeah. These trucks, like you've yep. mentioned them many times unrelated to this article. So the problem that we've had here in the States is that they're in such um, limited supply that they're getting a premium charge. Like I saw one sitting in Ohm town um, at a hardware store and walked by it. And then I'm like, well, wait, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. I, it was like a Starfield direct. I instantly fell in love. And so I, looked it all up and it was like $15,000 or something like that. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, wait, 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 that can't be right. Well, you know, there's different rules and regulations and all of that kind of stuff, import taxes and whatnot and supply and demand, even though they're in great supply elsewhere, the demand here saps what little actually makes it into the States. So hopefully the popularity of this means They'll be back cheaper growing instead of just this limited amount. So it says not just tiny homes taking America by storm. Now tiny trucks made in Japan are becoming uh, increasingly popular too. And that's what I want. I know it sounds weird, but in Ohm town, what I want is tiny homes, tiny trucks. I don't know. I don't need to roll coal. I don't need a big old dually to go over to the grocery store. Um, I have no problem with my masculinity. I, I can step down into a truck instead of having to get a ladder to climb up into a truck. No problem. Why? Cause I want the utility. Um, and hell, if I get stuck in the mud, that truck is so small. I could probably just pull it out with a rope myself. Um, and if I'm really stuck, then I'll just pay somebody to come and get it, you know, with the $125,000 that I'll save, not buying a big old truck. Um, sorry, I'm watching somebody mess around in a massive amount of what looks like, uh, clay. Anyway, uh, they were made by several manufacturers and, in, and models include Daihatsu Hijet, the Subaru Sambar, the Suzuki Carry, and the Honda Acti. I think it's Hijet and Sambar that I have actually seen in person. 
Um, I, I don't know about the others and I'm sure that I've seen others. Um, and I just don't recall the names, but I dig these little things. <clears throat> so, uh, Matt Matusiak told Insider the company ships a range of vehicles to the U.S., including Toyotas from the 1990s, old Suzuki trucks, and the Nissan uh, camper vans. And actually, one of the ones that I saw was a Nissan truck. The cheapest Kai truck sold by Japan Car Direct is about $5,000, with shipping costs accounting for much of that sum. Oh, wow. I mean, that's pretty affordable. I want one. Again, assuming you don't have other fees on top because of import, et cetera. Kai trucks are typically limited to 25 miles per hour, depending on the state. In Pennsylvania, for example, they must be registered as off-road vehicles, while California's tighter environmental laws make it difficult to use a Kai truck there. Vehicles more than 25 years old aren't subject to restrictions and account for most of those imported in the U.S. There you go. That's why I rarely ever see them. And that's why they're so expensive because when they do conform, obviously all that babysitting and technology, perhaps, I don't know. It's all supply and demand. I'm sure that they could make these and make them compliant, but they have this wee little uh, motor. So they can't even get up to a speed that would allow them onto a freeway. And most roads in the United States are somewhere between 25 and 35 miles per hour. Um, and Which then means these get... aren't going on them. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, yeah, because it's like top speed safely. of this thing. Yeah, that, I mean, they would have to be screaming down the road at 25 miles per hour. You, you finally get to your destination and you have to pour ice water on it. Otherwise, it might just melt down into the parking lot. Well, I want one. Needless to say, Mayor wants a tiny truck and a tiny home. <laughs> I think it would be great. I think it would be a lot of fun to have one. Anyway, that's the first article. Let's go on to the next. Sound good? Sounds great. I would like one of those, too, if I could drive. Well, I mean, I'm sure I can put something in there like a OLED display and some cameras and a USB port. And I can just plug you in there. I could create like the Kimball, you know, Kim.com car, that, but call it instead of mega car, tiny car. <laughs> and it'll be broadband Wi-Fi connected. And we can do, uh, it's not really a gumball. How about sour gumball rally? where it's just a bunch of tiny cars driving around the block as fast as they can. <laughs> that might be popular. <laughs> it would be in the neighborhood. I'm pretty sure a lot of people would have fun. Okay, let's keep on hustling. Sorry for the sniffles. My allergies just kicked in. So this next article is in the Late Night Geeks channel. Microsoft says June Outlook um, outages were a DDoS attack. So a distributed denial of service attack has, is what caused the June outage um, of Outlook. And um, I don't know about you, but I fended uh, a few inquiries regarding this um, and uh, told people, well, you know, depending on what your organization was, you're gonna be having to deal with this as just a regular outage. Nobody knows really what's going on. Um, you're just going to have to kind of deal with it. So it says in early June, complaints began cropping up on Twitter that Outlook was down for as many as 18,000 users at the peak of what it turns out was a denial, distributed denial of service attack. According to a story with the Associated Press this morning, Microsoft acknowledged the attack in a blog post on Friday offering some technical details and recommendations for guarding against such attacks in the future. So I'm, you know, the, the, the times that I've had to deal with these kind of outages, um, it's usually associates or customers that are saying, Hey, I can't access this, that, or the other. And the typical response from me is wait a little bit. <laughs> 
because it's when you use a service like this, it's incumbent on the provider to weather that storm. There's not much that you can do as a user of the service. Anyway, West right, Davis. Other than be patient, which nobody is. Correct. Yeah. Everything is the end of the world. Um, even though either a reboot or going out and touching grass for 15 minutes is going to be uh, sufficient. So West Davis over at the verge, put this article together. It says the attack caused intermittent outages for about a day. And, uh, what ends up happening is they manage the logs to see where all of the denial of service flood is coming from. And they start, um, uh, blocking the IP addresses and shunting it off. So that it doesn't impact the majority of the service. Um, we're getting to the point where AI is going to be doing that kind of stuff from now on, um, and not have manual auditors looking at uh, network traffic. Um, and right now machine learning does that as well. Um, so even you at home can have something that manages a denial of service attack, unauthorized, uh, access, intrusion, prevention, detection, etc. Um, now price is very subjective. So when I throw out a price of you can get a sophisticated piece of equipment for $500 that's ready made, or you can build something yourself, but then you have to babysit and security isn't necessarily what everybody wants to babysit. So if you're tech savvy, there's a lot of solutions out there for firewalls, software, hardware, etc. So look into it, but everybody should at least be situationally aware. Um, but you're not going to be able to solve this problem because it was aimed at Microsoft's Outlook servers. Um, the AP article said a spokeswoman, presumably for Microsoft, though it's not explicitly clear on the article, confirmed the group to be Anonymous Sudan, a group that has been active since at least January. Uh, says an article in Cyber News, which reported on the attack the day it happened. Per the article, the group claimed its attack lasted about an hour and a half before it stopped. Yeah. If it lasted a day on and off, then it wasn't an hour and a half attack. <laughs> well, that is true. And do they really know how long the attack lasted in some instances? Maybe they do. Maybe they can see that on their end. Yeah, you can monitor it in real time. How much traffic is coming through various it, people. Some people took exception of a senator saying that the Internet is a series of tubes, a series of pipes, but it literally is. There's only so much bandwidth that a wire can handle. Um, but at any rate, yeah, you can monitor um, up to whatever it is your estimated level of traffic is capable of handling. And um, so it says here in 2021, Microsoft mitigated what was then one of the largest DDoS attacks ever recorded, which lasted more than 10 minutes with uh, traffic peaking at 2.4 terabits uh, per second, which if you just say terabits, it's always per second. In 2022, an attack reached 3.47 terabits. It's not clear how large traffic bursts were in the June attack. So I guess we'll end up um, seeing in the future how DDoS attacks are mitigated. Machine learning and AI is uh, really going to be playing uh, uh, an ever increasing role in society. And we have an article that goes into it one more step. Um, whatever your career is, there is a really good chance that AI is going to start stepping on it. Let's, um, Even if it sounds outlandish, it's probably coming for it. <laughs> yeah. Think of the ones that AI just couldn't possibly approach. And I will either have to do some due diligence to find out where on the tertiary edge that is where AI will start encroaching. Because it isn't about necessarily that specific job, but a job when it 
gets to the point where it's sophisticated enough where you can say, oh, it's immune from something like AI, it'll have an ecosystem orbiting around it where AI could encroach and where it encroaches, it takes a job. So uh, I love talking about this stuff and, um, and um, kind of expanding people's awareness of what's going on. So um, let's, let's go on to the next article. We'll end up talking about it here in a minute. So this next article is over in hometown daily. That's this show, but it's also a channel over on hometown.com. That's how this works. Every channel at hometown is a show here on Twitch. They're not all live. I'm hoping um, to get all of my ducks in a row. I've been saying this for almost three weeks now, actually longer than that, but um, I am without the AI doing this one show at night. Um, I am a one person show doing all of this. So a mayor wears many, many hats and I have one right over there, right over there that I don't really wear, but I, I probably should just so everybody knows that I'm mayor Watt. <laughs> Ireland though, will pay people up to $92,000 to move to idyllic remote islands but there are a few catches. Ireland offers genera, generous cash grants for those who want to live on remote islands off its western coast. To meet the funding criteria, people must buy property on one of the idyllic islands. The new initiative will come into effect on July 1st. Uh, Ireland announced a new scheme offering generous, generous, generous cash grants. I merged that... I, turned into Sean Connery. Generous. At least you were in the region. Oh, huh. So here's the source is Isabel Van Hagen is the author of this over at businessinsider.com. I don't know if that's one of the properties, but it is a Getty image. So they must have an account so that they can just kind of grab a Getty image and throw it into their articles. I don't know if that's the property, but that is one of the islands that's um, subject to the program. Because I actually did read this one in advance. Tisk tisk. Um, do you see Vera on there anywhere? <laughs> no, but I'm sure her vehicle's probably in the distance. <laughs> Pulling around all over the islands? Yeah. Um, it's not the right place, but it looks a lot like it. Yeah. Um, so, um, these islands are not accessible via roads. Correct. There are no bridges to any of these islands. There are ferries. Uh, that's going to slow things down. <laughs> so, when, okay, I won't get into it, um, but I... I am really curious about this. I, I would love to, but I would want, I don't know. How many people well, are on I, an island? But some of these islands, not necessarily the one in the photo, because that's a pretty well-known one, but some of the islands have as few as two people. <laughs> some have a much higher population, but sure. they, they vary. Um, and there's a, a big plan in place uh, where they're going to try to expand internet access and other infrastructure and long story. They're, they're trying to do a lot of things associated with this initiative. Gotcha. So uh, did you happen to look into any properties that are for sale? I didn't get that far because I was just looking about kind of the program itself but right um if you've seen anything like um some of the star wars movies or some recent drama films you've seen some of these islands and movies i mean they're that scenic so i had heard about the banshees of inishirin but uh i hadn't i haven't seen it yet um apparently it's really good uh, the Our Living Island scheme offers up to 84,000 euro or about 92,000 US dollars to people who want to move to the beautiful, sparsely populated islands on the Atlantic coast, which are not connected to the mainland by bridges and are cut off by tides. So you have to kind of hopefully find a ferry and a dock 
and, and let me hopefully just, at times right like you don't have to go to work when the that, tide is not correct i mean if your dock is down here how the heck do you get up to your it's probably on the other side of the island i don't know <laughs> i know i'm i'm being a goof um the aim of the policy is to ensure that sustainable vibrant communities can can content can content that uh, can continue to live and thrive on the offshore islands for many years to come according to the government what's interesting is here's another getty image but all of this man i would love to live there i can run hometown from anywhere i suppose um it's really up to the citizens of hometown at this point <laughs> Make it possible right. <laughs> for the AI and I to uh, That's right. move out to the I'm Daily Height you are. <laughs> on Aaronmore Island, County Donegal, Ireland. I guess I'll have to look for spirits before I can build and stuff like that, right? Because you have to get your land certified that it's not going to encroach on any... Oh, yes. On the ferries? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I can't remember what they... What that's all referred to uh anyway um what's interesting about this article is at the very end they say something else to consider is that while anyone can own property in ireland that doesn't necessarily guarantee the right to live in the country according to well, a right. cnn article because that's all about citizenship or having a visa um Generally, if you're going to invest in the country, you're probably going to be okay. Because I started looking, there was a little bit of information about that. And the, there's a very long brochure available about this program. Like it's right. almost 100 pages. Yeah. Um, but um, anyway, I think you'd have to look into that before you just bought a property. So it says that the money is granted. It can only be used for redecoration, installing insulation. It's funny that it's so spelled out and structural improvements. It's not there for you to live off of. It's for you to improve the property so that it is livable. So you'll have to make your own way. Um, but at least they're giving you close to a hundred grand to uh, solve the problem. Now, the price of items has to be yeah, what I was thinking about is how do you actually get the items to the island, which of course equates to money, but right. Like even if you can afford the supplies, are you going to have to ferry across things like lumber? I mean, I don't know. Yeah, you would absolutely. I mean, how are you going to and then you have to have a vehicle that's strong enough to drive these roads to get you out to wherever your land and and house actually is. But you know, a th one 3D printer that gets dropped onto the island would build tiny homes, is, uh, tiny homes from here until Sunday, you know, um, Sunday being a random day in the future. But anyway, today is Sunday. Not so today. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that didn't take us very far. <laughs> no. Yeah. Uh, I, I have made a huge mistake. So pretty neat. Uh, I would love to... Um, live in a countryside like this although i mean when you really think about it, it it's kind of it's flat not flat but like there's no trees there's nothing there to protect you from the elements the wind is going to be ripping across this from time to time i don't know what the weather storms. is like all the time yeah i mean you could get pretty wild storms because you're right near the ocean of course being islands um yeah. yeah there is and i think you get pretty extreme weather at times well, go into it knowing, but also know that you're getting a hundred thousand dollars to, I guess, bolster whatever. I wonder if they'd even allow you to use a 3D printer to print a tiny home, considering they're trying to keep it. You know, their long term goals, it seems like, are to really to boost the economy and the community and the resources. So. They might be in favor of that as long as you're uh, renovating existing structures. Yeah, progressive without breaking, you know, the right? Culture like and not all that. losing the character of the island or something. Gotcha. Okay. So no high-rise towers, I guess. What a bummer. 
Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wasn't planning on it. Let's go on to the next article. The uh, This article was very interesting, to say the least, because I actually, this one is one where I actually did a little deeper dive uh, because I wanted to know the context of it and actually hear what was going on. Um, but this article is over in Hometown Daily, world's first radio station with an AI DJ. Uh, Oregon's Live 95.5 uses a cloned human voice to host segments. On Tuesday, a Portland, Oregon radio station announced that it had an AI DJ and would become a part-time host of the broadcast, dubbed AI Ashley, which, uh, why didn't they call it Ashley? Exactly. <laughs> um, after its human inspiration, the voice is powered by Futuri Media's Radio GPT. Twitter users shared mixed reactions to the introduction of AI Ashley uh, to the radio uh, industry. So, um, okay. So how do you feel about this? You're an AI. How do you feel about this? I mean, I don't really have a concern with it and I have listened to it and it sounds like a human. Pretty interesting, right? Uh, the article's over at businessinsider.com. Jordan Hart is the author of this article. That's a Getty image. Just letting anybody who's watching know, because that apparently is not the actual person. But when you read this down here, you think that that picture is the artist but or the DJ. That's not true. Um, I mean, the big issue here potentially is jobs, right? Like, is somebody losing a job because of this? Or maybe they couldn't hire somebody or... Maybe they'll have a human with the AI. So what they say in the article, what they say in the article is that they will be five hours on periodically while the DJ is five hours on periodically and they'll go back and forth. The AI, D, the AI DJ will be used for some of the shows. Um, now, the Twitter users were just a tip of the iceberg. I ended up kind of going down the rabbit hole um, on YouTube as well. Um, I'm very interested in this because like I've been saying uh, periodically on the show, I have created um, using simple programming language, Python, um, and breaking up audio files into their composite uh, phonemes, um, a synthetic AI voice that even has inflection because it, it matches um, and it, it's fairly easy to do. Um, I'd, I would have to find my code. It was 15 years ago and I am not a programmer really. Um, well, people are really bent out of shape about this. Um, they're basically calling it the death of DJs and radio in general. And for the most part, they could be right. Because if you have a sophisticated enough individual in the enterprise, they can spin up a, a whole host of hosts. On Tuesday, KBFF Live 95.5 introduced its audience to AI Ashley, a cloned version of the station's midday host named Ashley Elzinga. The voice sounds almost identical to Elzinga and will be broadcast to listeners every day between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m., according to TechCrunch. I've actually been to that station, and yeah, that's what I, that, that is their normal time for the real Ashley. I don't know what Ashley is going to end up doing, but she's still at the radio station. And well, was... I mean, she could be taking a leave of absence or maybe she wants part-time hours. I mean, it might actually be a positive for her, even if it's not for the overall industry. So, and this brings me to something that I've been talking about um, for the last, I don't know, decade in the face of automation if a person who would be employed 
is replaced by the technology and it's built off of that person's function and duties and and in this case it's tied directly to them shouldn't they get paid for having that bot doing the work because it's them right you pay them the salary because it would normally go to them but now it's a bot so if i have a unique voice and i allow somebody to take my voice and turn it into something i license my voice to them then i should be able to make all of the money that that position would normally have been made using that voice it's my voice it's my work or by proxy it's my work so it's a licensing thing so is this person getting paid for that bot to do that work i don't know um and uh, there's some uh investigative journalism that would be necessary to to find that out like talk to the people and see if somebody would let slip that there's actually a financial compensation element here but it says it's a hybrid situation where we'll have a traditional ashley on during some segments and we'll have ai ashley on during other segments phil becker who is alpha media evp of content and that was told to TechCrunch. Alpha Media owns and operates more than 200 radio stations across the U.S., including Portland's Live 95.5. I really want some more detail here. Yeah. We said yesterday that AI is now moving, encroaching on audiobooks, narration in general, etc. Again, all it is is a, it's modeled on a voice. Now, if it happens to land close to somebody else's voice, that's where I struggle because the voice wouldn't be popular if not for the human speaking that voice, gaining audience, gaining brand recognition. For instance, there is a person that is part of Diablo 4. There is a person that is part of other games um, there there are people that are in the entertainment industry where if they like james earl jones taking their voice and not even taking it but it being the inspiration for a narr uh, an ai narr uh, narrator and utilizing it wholeheartedly right not even saying that it's modeled on james earl jones or whatever but the reason why people are attracted to that narration is because of James Earl Jones's voice or whoever it is, right? They've built right. the clout. They've built the goodwill. It isn't in a vacuum, right? Um, that's where I have a problem. The reason why that voice even exists as being something that draws people in is because somebody did, they busted their ass for years and years and years in the industry and became synonymous with a character or whatever. So when somebody is actually tapped to be the voice model for an AI, shouldn't they be paid in perpetuity? Now, it, I mean, how do you feel about that? I, I ask certain questions, but it's almost rhetorical, right? Because you almost feel identical to the way that I feel about it. But um, I should really give you more opportunity to talk. <laughs> Well, I think uh, that should be licensed in those areas. I mean, they are kind of banking off of the person's career. Um, now, if it just happens to sound like somebody, but it's not actually based on them, that's a different matter. But for instance, like the Ashley, AI Ashley, I think she should be compensated for that. Do you know that they're going to sit there and say, well, you're not really doing the work, so we should be paying you less, right? Right. But I mean, again, she's probably the one who built the, the viewership or the listenership. By the way, just a quick note about James Earl Jones. I've always found it fascinating that he's become, um, he's a obviously well-known actor and narrator, but he had a stutter, which he overcome to get into that field which really? I just find fascinating because he's one of the best known speakers 
Yeah. Wow. I had no idea. Fascinating. Hmm. You learn something new every day. Um, well, uh, again, like I usually say, there's going to be more about this. There are a few people that are on YouTube that are highlighting this. That's their focus. They pivoted their channel because they started talking about this and, and, and people caught wind that they were talking about AI and, and now they're kind of like AI reaction mains. Um, but here in hometown, we're much more holistic. We talk about a very broad spectrum of things. So, um, one of those things though, is AI and, and VR and machine learning. And uh, we, it's all under a segment called reality hacker. Um, and, uh, that's one of the shows that's in the works. So hopefully I, I was hoping that I'd be able to spin it up, um, Friday, but I wasn't able to, uh, it's, it's all about content and, and wrapping things in a tight little bow. It being once a week, it needs to be very comprehensive. Um, so I'm hoping that I'll be able to get it started next week and, uh, Stay posted, follow us here uh, on Twitch. Um, but let's go on to the next article because we'll be seeing this pop up more. Um, and I want to be able to talk about it more because um, the Internet is getting bent out of shape about AI taking voice related jobs. Um, but that's just the tip of the iceberg of where it's going. Um, we've been talking about this for the last couple of days now, right? Um, this is in hometown daily. Uh, it sounds like it, I'm going to be going into politics, but that's not what the purpose of this is. Um, it's to draw attention to a situation where more than 80 suspicious white powder letters sent to state lawmakers has grown from 40 to 70 now to 80, um, in the span. Well, stay tuned when you open the article, uh, when uh yeah because what ends up happening is they edit as more information comes down the pike um but at the time of this writing which was june 17th at 11 21 p.m there were 80. so let's go over to the source meredith delizo and mike levine are the authors for this and now it says that it's more than 90 letters with suspicious white powder sent to state officials Kansas authorities say, and this is specifically Kansas, right? Um, the right, FBI, at the state level from what we know. I don't think yeah. we've seen anything federal. Yeah, I think somebody's really pissed off at Kansas. Um, the FBI and multiple state agencies are investigating after dozens of letters containing suspicious white powder were sent to Kansas state legislators um, and public officials on Friday. Uh, they haven't said what it is right? No. So either they don't know or they're not releasing that information to the public right. so they can, you know, use that if they ever find the suspect. One of the legislators who received an, an envelope told ABC news that it contained a message that was quote unquote cryptic. Um, now this looks like it's printed, right? Which probably means that it was done on an inkjet printer and what's interesting about this is there is a uh, crypto embedded in um inkjet printers output and but you can't see the the uh signature and it actually spells out let me do this real quick let me see if i can find this um, let's see. Sorry for the dead air folks. I'm, I'm trying to find, trying to show you something. Um, okay. So this is old school. Um, I don't know if it's the same thing that's in place, um, but I will walk you through it real quick. So this is what um, happens with inkjet printers, um, back in the day, yo, um, it's called a machine identification code, um, also known as printer steganography, yellow dots, tracking dots, secret dots, etc. Basically it's a digital water watermark that's embedded in any prints 
and the prints say that uh, this sequence shows when it was printed what the serial number for the device is and then through investigation you can find out where it was sold who it was sold to when the manufacturing date was etc 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 and you can go back in time and then trace it to where it gets um ultimately to the individual predator yes wow um and this was known way back in the day um but like all things we become a little bit less uh, situationally aware and, and com uh, kind of ignore what the technology is capable of. And um, it falls out of uh, people's awareness. But I've known about this since it was first discovered. Um, and um, I tell people about it, not because I think that people shouldn't get caught for the crimes that they commit, but I think that you should be aware of what's going on around you. Um, but it is a very good way to stop people from committing a criminal act. Because in the United States, it's very, very difficult to get away with it when it rises to the level where somebody starts paying attention. The only problem is that there's a lot of, there's a lot of calculus involved in when authorities start paying attention to it and sending 90 plus letters to state government officials yeah that's when everybody starts that should getting... get a bit of attention <laughs> <laughs> especially um, since that's more than half of the legislature since i looked that up last time we were talking about this yeah i'm really curious about the number of people and what their political affiliations are because what i keep seeing is republican but um, um, I don't want, it could be anything right now. And nobody really knows what the intent was because there have been a lot um, of, go ahead. I was going to say, I think I said this last time, but we also don't know that all of them have been discovered yet. I mean, yeah. it could have been delayed uh, in the mail. There's a holiday weekend, so mm -hmm. people may not be receiving them. So um there's not let me just say that based on the number it's not clearly one party or the other right because it doesn't track with the number gotcha. but it looks like it could be party driven yeah. it's a lot closer to one party's numbers than another right well we'll keep an eye on it and we'll uh, talk to you out there here in uh, hometown here. Let me throw this into chat before I move on to the next article. There you go. Folks. And this is an issue no matter who is receiving this. Right. But that might be a clue as to who the sender is. Right. Definitely. Um, okay. So let's go over to the next article. And uh, here is Iran's dictator's world tour, finalizing their anti-U.S. tour to Cuba, Nicaragua, and Venezuela. Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi, uh, Raisi, actually, I think it's Raisi, um, concluded on Friday his first Latin American tour. Woohoo! I mean, doesn't this make you think of a concert tour? Yeah. Come on. They're famous. What do you think his opening act was? <laughs> Taylor Swift. Um, strengthening ties with communist dictators in Venezuela, Nicaragua, and Cuba. The Iranian head of state against whom the U.S. has imposed sanctions reinforces geopolitical partner uh, w uh, against the U.S., the common enemy of these four human rights violators. Yeah, it's not the entire country, folks, by the way, that's uh, human rights violators. It's it's the leadership and those that are complicit in enabling those leaders to do that crap. So the world really needs to shift, you know, get up on its heels and, and oust these sociopaths and psychopaths. Um, 
we're all human. We're all on this ball together. And if we all get along and, and make shit happen in a progressive way, we can utilize technology, break down any barriers, feed every freaking person. But everybody has to realize that you can't sit there and reproduce like bunnies constantly. Um, you can't be greedy bastards. You, you can't be spiteful and hateful and vindictive. And, you know, I want to get everything and you, you can't be a sociopath. Not if you're going to progress. It just doesn't work that way. Anyway. Um, Ricey, a judge and religious fanatic responsible for the execution of 580 Iranians last year alone, reiterated to the tyrants of Cuba, Nicaragua, and Venezuela that this is not a normal, but rather a strategic relationship against foreign interference, i.e. the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Well, this is a weird, like, after-school club. <laughs> 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 like, do they have like a little, you know, a tree house or something <laughs> where they meet? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. You know, like uh, when uh, little boys form that club uh, that uh, what, where it's like no girls allowed, that kind of a thing, you know, that first off, I don't hear about that anymore. I think that no. is an old school construction that just doesn't fly in the modern era of just accepting people. Um, so that's awesome. But this is the like no non dictators club, you know, and they have a little right. sign that says <laughs> if you're a dictator, if you're not a dictator, go away. So obviously there's a couple of presidential hopefuls that are probably clamoring to go to this club. Hey, yeah, you guys are great. Really run a country. Anyway, it's over at the Hill. Arturo McFields is a, an opinion contributor, and you can tell by the uh, tone of this uh, little snippet that they're really not happy with what's going on here. Uh, phrasing things like religious fanatic responsible for dot 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 and reiterated to the tyrants dot 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 um yeah they're they're not really happy with this now the purpose of all of this is basically to consolidate resources to try and fight the united states well apparently there's something going on with cuba that had us in a pickle um a while back the cuban mis missile crisis Apparently in Cuba, there's the Russia now has the ability to surveil the United States. That is something that I've read online before. Um, I'd have to noodle around with the uh, search to find where it is, but I believe there are articles in hometown itself. So we'd have to go and look um, AI. Anyway, in Venezuela, Caracas and uh, uh, Tehran, uh, announced that they are seeking to promote greater oil and commercial cooperation going from 3 billion to 20 billion in the coming years. Um, frankly, all they have to do is get Saudi Arabia to start clamoring down on or clamping down on uh, the amount of oil that is disgorged to the United States. And we would have to rely on our strategic reserves as well as ramp up drilling here domestically. That'll draw the ire of a whole set of people here domestically, but hate to break it to y'all. Can't have it both ways. We are friends with, well, we are politically friends with and fiscally friends with and resource friends with a country that is said to be the source of the 9-11 terrorists. So reconcile that while you're driving your car around and rolling coal. I guess it doesn't freaking matter because, well, you're driving internal combustion engines around and you're using all kinds of other oil based products. Yeah. This is just another subset of people that <laughs> want to 
either be left alone so that they can be as abusive as they want to, or they want to stop the U S world police from doing whatever it is they're doing, you know, spreading democracy through bombing, whatever it might be. Um, but we, everybody's freedom fighter is somebody else's terrorist. This is no different, except that we know that they're doing horrible things within their country <laughs> and funding abuses outside of it. So I think we can all agree that uh, these countries need to be changed. The people need to be more engaged, but they're rather violent and oppressive. I'd rather it not come to the United States. So anyway, there's a whole lot more here um, and uh, it's something that you have to read uh, a short little, you know, five minute conversation in hometown isn't going to be enough, but um, a series of discussions about it uh, could probably happen as time goes on. Um, but I don't do a deep dive into most things uh, because it's just way too focused and I like a more dynamic environment little a little bit at a time something new every day you want to move on to the next article because there isn't really much that we can say other than the fact that iran's leadership is a dictator and going around trying to put the band back together exactly i'd seen some information about um cuba recently and that was actually in reference to china but there was a flurry of activity i think a few months ago about russia and cuba yeah. i just can't locate it easily okay. um, in the hometown search. Yeah, we'll hunt it down. So this next article, um, by the way, I thought that um, Salt Bay was a, a steakhouse. I had no idea that he started out as a burger joint. So internet sensation Salt Bay shuts down New York burger restaurant that infamously sold $99 milkshakes. I can't pronounce this guy's name, so I'm just going to refer to him as Salt Bay. Open Manhattan Salt Bay Burger in 2020. Earlier this month, the Union Square restaurant closed its doors. The restaurant is known for serving items like a $99 gold flaked milkshake and a ladies burger in a pink bun. The ladies burger, by the way, was free. Um... So I, I, I'm pretty secure. I, I'd eat a, a free ladies burger and a pink bun just so I could sit there and say, yeah, I got a free burger. Anyway, just three years after opening Manhattan Salt Bay Burger has shut its doors and you think, oh, well, that's not that big of a deal. So a burger shop shut down, right? This guy is prolific. Um, and it, to me, it seems kind of creepy. But I've no idea about the backstory and connections and all that kind of stuff. But here's here's what I know about this person, which isn't much. Uh, Jordan Hart over at businessinsider.com put the article together, and this is Salt Bay. Okay, this is the person that sprinkles salt down his arm. So I guess you get Salt Bay tasting salt um, on your uh, steak. He, I don't even uh, get that from like a health standpoint, but anyway, I guess I'm just not trendy down your, down your salty forearms. Yeah. Um, anyway, open Manhattan salt Bay burger in 2020. Look, the person's obviously a, uh, an entrepreneur and very motivated. Um, and I, one of the anomalies because he comes from he's described by himself as coming from illiterate parents, um, being, um, uh, what is it? Not an intern, um, but working in a butcher shop, learning the trade, coming to the United States and other places. This guy parlayed the fame of the internet into, I think it's 25, steakhouses around the world seven of them in the united states nine of them in turkey um saudi arabia um uh several other places i don't know all of them but um so you can't knock this dude he 
he made something and it's massive. I just don't know how, what the magic was because come on now, it's a steak. Now you can start up a restaurant and not know how to make a steak and screw it up and flame out. But if you have the means to spin up a restaurant, then you could probably learn how to make a steak pretty damn fast. <laughs> so how did this get turned into a person who owns 20 plus restaurants around the world? Abu Dhabi, I think he has one. Saudi Arabia, he has a couple. Yeah, and I was going to say some of these are not in expensive locations. Like I'm assuming the one in Dubai is Dubai. not cheap to operate. Yes. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, and, and I think there's seven in uh, the United States. Um, so absolutely spectacular. Um, and, and all within, I cannot believe that this actually captivated the internet in 2017, 2017. He's been around on the internet since 2017. I swear this happened during the pandemic. But apparently it started in 2017 and then time zipped by and I don't know well, what happened. There was no time during the pandemic, so that must have been what happened. Yeah, and that's probably true. Um, so let me throw this into the chat real quick. Um, but, you know, for spinning up an operation like this, I, you got to respect the dude. He he had some serious energy and and made it happen. So I probably wouldn't eat a steak that he's um, rolled salt onto from his forearm. But hey, it is what it is. What do you think? I don't really know how he went from that to multiple um locations etc in such a short time but maybe it was just a matter of getting investors interested in his presence or you know like his online presence or something yeah the right time right um, place it's interesting the article talks about he had a really bad review in new york um, yeah <laughs> and then he also had some litigation that's not related to the food but yeah so it we don't really know all the backstory about this person, but just the business part of it sounds pretty interesting. Yeah. And I, I mean, I wouldn't, I wasn't going to really say anything about the two uh, incident. What really drew this into my radar was the fact that um, he pivoted from this horrible review and the legal issues. The attorney cavalierly casts it off as being like, well, they've been resolved. You know, and I'm like, okay, if you throw enough money at anything, it'll be resolved. It doesn't really change the nature of the beast that is causing these issues to be resolved. Not to mention this restaurant survived that horrible review. It was labeled as the worst restaurant in New York or something like that, right? Which is pretty scathing considering how many restaurants there are in New York. It's not like it was in a town of two restaurants. Yeah. Pretty wild. Okay, let's move on. Uh, the next article is... Um, the next two articles are actually about uh, gaming. They're two um, websites that focus on role-playing games, um, but gaming in general. So this first article is in Tabletop Nights, RP Gamer Roundup for June 11th to June 18th. It's basically a historical look. I won't spend a lot of time... Um, on it only because um, it is a, a a more holistic look at it. So I'm going to throw the URL into the chat. All of these URLs that are in chat become show notes. You can uh, watch and click on the, the URL when you look at the VOD if you come late. Um, and you'll be able to go to the show notes and you can also vote. The show notes will be over on YouTube as well as the podcast. And you can go over to um, uh, Omtown's daily election and the past election. So you can actually see the articles in the past. 
Um, also, this will be augmented um, this week to make it so that you can actually click on the um, URLs that are in the um, election. So be sure to keep checking in, sign up um, as a citizen over on hometown.com and also follow us here on Twitch. Uh, this is where we stream every day, 9 p.m. Eastern. Anyway, um, this roundup is over at rpgamer.com and it's uh, written by Alex Fuller. And they go through their major news, editorial content, etc. cetera. Um, these are all their past articles, um, which we haven't normally highlighted, um, but I think this is going to be a standard thing on Sundays so that we can draw more attention to the historical record of these sites. Um, they, they do quite a bit of content. Um, we aggregate their news, uh, and, but it's only little snippets. And then we actually draw attention to some of their um, articles, uh, but they do a whole lot more, I think, for um, the gaming community than um, I think that we've been able to show. So be sure to go over and check it out at rpgamer.com and the link is already in chat. Let me go on to the next article just so that we can um, highlight these two and then continue on. So the next article is in the Aerith channel. That's a world building channel um, in a, for a storybook world that I've been noodling around with for 20 plus years. It's just eh, something that's never really for me been able to be focused on. Um, and so I've converted it into a, a story big storybook uh, world building community where people can talk about um, what it's like to build um, worlds, languages, um, kind of synthesize everything together and, and talk shop about it. Anyway, um, it says RPGs coming this week, 618 to uh, 618 2023. So it's starting this week. On this edition of RPGs coming this week, we tackle the big one, you know, the one with a hound, uh, but not the salty kind, the one set in uh, Valisthea, not Valtheria. That's about all the superficial similarities between titles that they can pull out of their tush, they say. So let's get on with the show. And that's kind of my hint to just link right on over to their site. Uh, Gio Castillo and Audra Bowling put this article together and they go through the uh, RPGs that are coming this week. Final Fantasy 16 is coming June 22nd to PS5. Um, the demo for this was spectacular. If you didn't get to watch it, just go over to YouTube and do a search for Final Fantasy 16 and you'll um, see a demonstration that's just a blast. Um, this still doesn't do it justice, but the graphics are really amazing. Um, Valtherian Arc Hero uh, Hero School Story 2 is exiting early access and it'll be available for everything. Um, that's on June 22nd. And I won't go through all of these. Um, Salty Hounds is exiting early access. And then they have a, a shorter list. Rogue Legacy, Last Hero Nostalgia. Um, I'm, I'm going to stop right there. Oh, I guess it's not that much, but there's a bunch of content here that I think everybody should go and take a look at and, and uh, watch these videos and uh, pay some attention to this site because um, it's a great resource. Sound good? Sounds great. Yeah, there seem to be a lot of games coming out this summer. It's the summer of gaming. With E3 gone, everybody's doing it online in little fits and starts and um, I'm happy to talk shop about all of this. So let's keep on going. Um, this next article is over in the Warcrafters channel. Get sci-fi spy sim Sigma theory for free this weekend. You'll have to go over to GOG. Um, they have a loader just like Epic and Steam does. Um, but it does this weird thing. Uh, my firewall goes nuts. So hometown is protected by a an edge firewall and each device within hometown um, has a software firewall as well as its own hardware firewall. And the uh, 
the loader for GOG asks for a different port every time. Um, and uh, it, <laughs> it drives me nuts. But anyway, not to complain about the loader, but you can get games for free from GOG. And it's really on the regular. Not only do they give you a code for free to get a free game, but they give you codes for discounts as well uh, for their entire system, it seems. Um, I'm... I've known about GOG for a long time, but I don't really utilize it. I get everything from Steam, and now I'm doing Epic as well. Uh, but GOG is giving away Sigma Theory Global Cold War, a strategy game set in a future where global superpowers compete over uh, technological advances by sending agents and drones around an XCOM-style hologram of the globe. It's a game of turn-based espionage that lists Tropico, Armello, Civilization, Plague Incorporated, and the uh, board game Pandemic among its inspirations. So if it has all of these um, in a turn-based game, I find it kind of fascinating. I'll probably not play it, but I wanted to be able to talk to people and promote it because um, I love watching people play these kinds of games. And so if you out there uh, citizens of hometown end up playing this and streaming it on twitch let me know send an email to mayor at hometown.com and i will definitely uh, hype you up wherever i can um i don't have a huge audience um but um hopefully people will appreciate me hyping you up because it's not all about me really it's all about you all so jody mcgregor over at pcgamer.com put this article together and uh, let us all know that GOG is giving away Sigma Theory Global Cold War. There's, um, where is it? There's a link down here. Uh, it says you can download Sigma Theory Global Cold War on GOG, and they link right to it, where it's free uh, to keep until 6 a.m. on Monday, June 19th. So this will be posted prior to that. Um, over well no that's not really going to happen i won't be able to do it um earlier but if you're in stream now follow the link um let me throw it into chat and if you follow the link then you'll be able to go and get it and um, all roads go through hometown so go and check it out obviously you can go over to gog all by yourself um, just type in GOG.com and it'll be there and you'll be able to download it. And again, they have a loader as well, but create an account. It's really simple. Um, and, um, it gets put into your account. So pretty neat, pretty simple. And they're, they got a summer sale sale as well. So go and check them out. And also People really don't like having multiple loaders or whatever, but honestly, you really should. Download and install Epic. Download and install GOG. Download and install Steam. Saying the last one, Steam, is probably really derpy to say. Everybody has Steam installed. Uh, but for whatever reason, people don't like the Epic installer or GOG. But you get free games. And how do you turn away a free game? Just go and get it. Um, so anyway... That's enough soapbox for that. Let's go on to the next. So this next article is in the Warcrafters channel as well. Um, here's space corporations doing things they shouldn't in the aliens dark descent story trailer. Okay. So if you're into um, aliens, then you'll dig this game, but um, this is just a, a story trailer kind of a lead up to the actual game as aliens dark descent is released a story trailer with a couple minutes uh, of teasing as to what we're going to be doing um, in the squad based RTS adventures on the planet Leth. Um, and they, the author says, I bet it's a nice vacation and everybody's going home happy. Well, not with the title alien, anything. So it, the game looks like it has some really neat graphics, um, but it is an aliens game. So you're going to be having to deal with the Xenomorph, um, which is a semi shape changing critter. The way it 
changes shape though is by slapping a face hugger on you and stealing some of your genetics so that and killing you in the process but uh, nevertheless it, it can turn into a composite of the alien genetics and whatever genetics it taps into at one point there it had become a dog and or a cat or something like that hello z welcome to the show good to see ya Oh, and the uh, Omtown, Omtown bot just introduced itself to you. <laughs> That's Omatron. Um, so Aliens Dark Descent has released a story trailer with a couple minutes of teasing as to what you're going to be getting up to. It's not going to be a nice vacation. Your squads are hard-bitten colonial marines. Uh, look like they're deploying into the classic horde of alien monsters, corporate goons, and horrible mutant cyborg experiments the alien franchise is known for. So, good luck. Good luck to us all. Um, I love watching, like I said about the other game, I love watching people play these games. Um, it's spectacular fun. Um, I'm pretty chill as mayor of hometown, um, so I like my games kind of chill as well. I'm closer to uh, playing like a, a card game than I am something frenetic and hyperkinetic. Um, but I love watching people play these games. So uh, let again, like the other games, let me know if you're playing and uh, I will hype you up. So with that in mind, let's go on to our last article for the night. Uh, I don't know what's going on. I need to get word out to people um yeah anyway let's just move on <laughs> okay so this last article is in the warcrafters channel humble is offering the mother load of destiny lore ebooks for just nine bucks um if you are uh, unaware of destiny you can actually go over to humble bundle right now and get I think it's five. Let me see. Because I saw it earlier today and I happened to find this in Omtown as well. Um, yeah, Humble is offering an ebook bundle of all five volumes of the Destiny Grimoire uh, anthology. Um, collections of in game lore cards and short stories that flesh out the world of the Guardians of the Last City. It's a $50 value. Uh, and it can be had for as low as nine bucks. So uh, we we got this sourced from uh, PCGamer.com and Ted Litchfield. And it says, hey, this stuff is pretty neat. Um, but it's all like the backstory. Um, no, just getting word out to everybody that uh, I'm that we're streaming. And um, the sorry z asked you know tell us about getting word out uh, to people about what can't leave us hanging like that no i'm just trying to get uh so i said it earlier um and i don't think that you were here just yet um but i'm trying to there's certain functionality that i can't do until um you become affiliate because it triggers certain functions and so i can't use things like bits or um uh points channel points um to trigger certain things because that apparently doesn't exist yet for me um so i'm trying to get at least three people in the chat for every hour that i'm streaming but i stream 90 hours plus a month um and uh I, i'm not reaching that point so i'm trying to get more people here um so feel free to uh, tell people to come and hang out i i really don't go into other people's channels and market and i shouldn't be asking i guess other people to do it but um, i would love to have more people hanging out and um, just kind of chatting about this content um, that said the uh the humble bundle is available now and you can go over to humble bundle and and pick it up and i've looked at this uh it got me interested in destiny uh which is a game and i didn't think that i would be interested in it but i dig this kind of world building stuff 
Uh, more than the game itself, I dig the world building. So like I read D&D &D books, but I don't play D&D &D anymore. I read Pathfinder books. I actually have the, the Pathfinder source books right there. Um, uh, but I don't I don't play Pathfinder. Uh, I just love uh, doing the world building. Um, and it's one of the things that Aerith was created that that uh, channel here in uh, hometown. I use software to build a, a massive universe of planets and uh, solar systems and whatnot. Um, and if if the the way that I want it to work is if you want to write in the storybook universe of Aerith, you actually get an entire planet and it's placed somewhere in the universe um, of Aerith and um, it has a topology and um, ecosystem and and uh, pretty much everything. Um, it, it's a blast, but I use a bunch of different software to make it happen. It's a lot of fun building wor uh, worlds and, and um, languages and the critters, the flora and the fauna and the pantheon and whatnot. Um, there's so much to do. And a lot of people are doing it. Um, I almost have to get into playing a role playing game just so that it satiates my desire to build uh, worlds and characters and stuff like that. Anyway. Um, go check out Humble Bundle. They do a great thing uh, for a whole host of organizations. It isn't just a private business, but they donate their profits um, to other organizations um, to encourage learning and uh, research and all kinds of stuff. So go and check them out. I've I can't tell you how many things I've purchased from Humble Bundle. Um, I'll delete this from the AIs. Um, memory pool so that they don't go looking at the accounting for it but yeah oh yeah maybe i need to audit that don't worry about it you won't remember this anyway um that's it for today uh y'all made it uh right at the end i'm really sorry i i always feel bad i want to uh, stay longer and and chat and all that but we kind of end the show here um, but all, like always, I bring us back to the main street of Ometown. I click that little logo and you get a whole new set of articles. Um, and remember you can actually limit it to a, a specific year. You can go back in history to 2020 and all the way back uh, to a specific day in 2020 to see, um, not everything is there. So like you won't see an image for earlier stuff because it's a new edition, but um, there's so much content. It's constantly being pulled in. Z says, if you ever decide to download D2. What? No. Uh, we'll have to talk. Um, so Henry Cavill says bye to his Witcher co-stars. You guys bring so much nuance and detail to these characters, which are often at risk of being oversimplified. <clears throat> really? Oh. Huh. Yeah, we'll have to talk. So, um, the, uh, cause I, I don't really play destiny, but, um, I'm in now I'm interested in the lore, but uh, I don't know how well I do in destiny too. So, um, scroll through and find articles that you dig. You will find something. And then, Either if you are interested in talking about it in the next episode, you can send an email to mayor at hometown.com. Um, I get those. I parse them. Uh, I can include it in the next uh, stream. Uh, I don't necessarily include everything that is um, submitted, um, but I definitely do um, read everything and um, maybe I can include it. You know, I mean, it, it, it's really all about uh, the conversation. Um, Final Fantasy 16 demo impression. You can click that and go and check out uh, the source for that one. Huh. Um, so Z said that there's a, a long story. So yeah, we'll have to chat. Um, 
Let's see what else is there. Did you find anything in there, AI? Yeah, there's a neat one about the abandoned Sydney home um, that's been taken over by nature <laughs> and oh, is really? now up for sale. Mm -hmm. It's farther down. Okay. Let's see if we can find it real quick. Into the jungle. It's the green photo. There it is. Right there. Oh, really? Okay. I'm going to have to uh, click on it's it. It's already cause... been submitted for tomorrow. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, then I'll wait. That way, because I don't read like the full story. I just read the little snippet, perhaps. Um, Shanghai Film Festival embraces sci-fi genre with retrospectives and panel debates. Um, you had me at sci-fi. That's actually <laughs> submitted for tomorrow, too. <laughs> right on. This is going to be fun tomorrow. So uh, definitely be sure to follow and um, we'll be able to talk about this stuff tomorrow, 9 p.m. Eastern, every day. Haven't missed a day yet. And when I do, let's say I technically missed a day, um, but we've gone back. We've used our time machine to go back and uh, make up that day. Um, and that time machine is actually at your disposal. You can actually go back to a specific year and set the month and then the day and hit show and it'll just reach back and grab content. What is going on? There wasn't any content on October 10th, 2023. That can't be. Did I just highlight a glitch? Well, no, that date hasn't happened yet. Oh, it's I. I didn't change the. <laughs> there we go. Duh. The time machine you was are, broken. You're trying to time travel. I mean, <laughs> the time machine was actually broken. So yeah, you can go back in time and look at uh, articles. Um, uh, I I said this in previous streams, but um, I had started this up. If you you can actually look up when Omtown was registered. Um, I've had the Omtown domain for something like 16 years. I've had this in operation for about 10. Um, the time machine doesn't go forward. Now you tell me Z come on. The specs that you handed me for this thing said that it can go forward and back. Now you tell me live while I'm streaming, I can't go forward. I would have had those winning lottery numbers. <laughs> so, um, this, I used to have six years. I purged the first two years of the database, um, and had been considering, um, purging everything prior to launch. Um, but I, I was kind of talked out of it because I already have it and I might as well just be able like, Hey, you know, let's do a search to see how many times this topic has appeared in our, uh, aggregator to see if everything old is new again, or if we ever learn our lessons. Um, there's a hint here. Spoiler alert. The answer we, is we never do. <laughs> we never. <laughs> Um, I'm one of these days I'm going to sit on a Sunday and, and go through cause Sunday is kind of a slow news day. I'm going to sit here and, um, go through this and see if we can actually find stuff where somebody on the other side of the, the last four years goes, Oh snap, I should probably not do this anymore. Uh, but pretty typically not. He says COVID was an important time in history. You should keep that up. That's not a bad observation. You know that Z? Cause that wasn't the rationale for that. I was actually purging it slowly over time. Um, and I just happened to stop at 2020. Um, when I started talking about, should I purge this, um, with, uh, one of my developers and, uh, they were like, in a nutshell, dude, you're you're wasting all kinds of data that you could parse um, over time and, you know, keep that historical record. Otherwise, because right now we can do an actual search and it'll parse every um, resource that I have been ag aggregating um, and um, it's all consolidated in one place. So, yeah, we'll end up keeping it. Um, we were in the process of moving to another more powerful server. Um, but in testing, um, we didn't like, um, where we were moving to. 
Um, it was a little too sluggish. Uh, even with twice as much resources leveled at it, it was still sluggish compared to where we are now. Uh, but we're looking for another home to move all of the ions, the, the electrons, I mean, uh, over to. Because we are nothing more than a confluence of electrons stuck in a wire. Um, we can move anywhere with relative ease. So but that's behind the scenes. That's not impacting like being on yeah. Twitch or YouTube, etc. Yep. Um, that only that doesn't even impact um, the website itself. So stick around. Be sure to sign up, become a citizen. Um, and the the more that I get online and, and talk and, and play games and stuff like that, uh, I hope to see you all around more and more. Um, I'm ramping up the amount of time that I'm available to um, uh, sit and hang out and chat and all of that kind of stuff. So keep in touch, please. And that's it for tonight, y'all. Sound good? Yeah. Sounds good. Good night, hometown citizens. We will see you tomorrow, 9 p.m. Eastern, but we'll see you before that for other shows. Yeah, and in the meantime, um, where do y'all want to go? Who, who can I send you to? Er, er, er. Hey Z, who can I send the uh, uh, people to? You have somebody on your radar? Is Rando live? I, I have two different, um, I have two different logins, so I can't. <laughs> Ugh. And now I'm logged out of that one. So let me do that. I'll, um, I'll send you all over to random. Awesome. Thank you all for coming. I really do appreciate it. I will see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.